time because the close interoperational liaison between the CIA and the British and MI6 meant that uh, the expulsion of homosexuals out of the CIA had been already done and now uh, homosexuals should be thrown out of British secret services after the principle of masters and slaves. I explained it talking about flip flop, the British as slaves and the Americans as masters. Mm. And so, uh, and Turing got a medical treatment, he got female breasts, and in 1954 he poisoned himself by eating a poisoned apple because he loved the um, Cinderella movie by Walt Disney. And he died like Russian Snow White. Snow White, okay. And two years later, one of the... Uh, two years later in 56, one of Bletchley Park's navigators, so-called navigators, experienced an almost, almost the same suicide. Mm, navigators were the men who mean uh, inside British interceptor, intercepting uh, planes that, who got the secret German message. And ordered to Bletchley Park. And in, in, my, in my case, in my, my case deals with a, with a certain Michael Ventris, Greek origin, but living in England, a uh, young, promising architect um, who had, three, uh, two, three or four years before his death, uh, successfully decided the Linear B inscription in Proto-Greek uh, Greek discovered by Sir Arthur Evans. And Ventris had deciphered this script, this Greek script, going back to 1007 or 6 centuries before this so-called Jesus uh, And he went with deciphered this unknown script and proved by Bletchley Park's methodology that it must have been great, great. And now it's in, 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 in classical humanities, it's totally accept, it's accepted this decipherment. But uh, on, a, on an early morning, on an empty road outside of London, Ventris uh, had a car accident and died, and this doesn't please me, pleases me too much. Thanks for listening. We had such inspiring lunch talks with Americans and Germans that I had, had to make some, some after remarks before we can go on in this electronic era. First remark is personal. I forgot to quote the song Pink, the song uh, Manchester Metal. Probably you don't know it anymore. The song begin, this Pink Floyd song begins with two lines saying, um, Icy winds of icy winds of night being gone, 
this is not your domain. Of course, Manchester Meadows, or Sunny Meadows, and now we have Sunny Meadows before our very eyes. Thanks to the goddesses and God. <coughs> and now to the more historical remarks. Mm -hmm. In showing you on the blackboard the difference between Leibniz and Boolean calculation, you might have got the first impression that there are no, there's not just one general algebra, but there are many different algebras. And I showed you the difference between Leibniz and Bool algebra by showing you that one plus one following Leibniz results in two written as ten, seemingly ten, with carry flag. And while in Boolean algebra one plus one, one and one is one. So algebras are sensibly different from another, each from another. <coughs> Um, so far for my after reflections and now the inspirations come ca that came from lunch talks. Mm. I'm, I did mention in passing the Penemünde based analog computer uh, of the rocket V2. I forgot to mention the fact that uh, the fact that even before Shannon theoretically proved that the whole of Boolean algebra can be handled by telegraph or telephone relay devices, uh, a German simple-minded simple engineer uh, built a functioning computer which did logic and arithmetic with these uh, switch uh, relay uh, elements devices. His name was Konrad Suse. Invented this functioning device whose replication you can see in exposed in Berlin in the Technical Museum <coughs> for private purposes as a student who didn't like uh, arithmetical calculations, mm -hmm. lengthy arithmetical engineering calculations. And the Wehrmacht, the German army, got wind of his private invention during the war and the Zuse Z3, Z3, Z like Zuse, Zuse, uh, was used for very crazy uh, purposes in the German Air Force. The The Wehrmacht, surrounded by the Allied forces, had growing difficulties to, to get raw materials and metals and nickel and uh, aluminium and so on. And, and so they, 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 they used what they had, and this was not so precise and elegant as the engineers wanted it to do, the engineers of Messerschmitt or Heinkel and, and so on. And the wings of the airplanes were badly 
constructed because of material, metal failure, but Zeus's, Zeus's computer could uh, detect the, the errors, the defects, and calculate some software which, uh, which corrugate, which corrected the hardware errors or hard hardware failures. So you had a first case of software supplying or replacing hardware. And after the war, Zeus's computers lived for certain decades until uh, Intel's architecture was worldwide victorious and Zuse was leading in Zuse machines were leading in in scanners and plotters so computer graphics was some people pretend that computer graphics were invented based on Zuse computers at the Technical University of Stuttgart this is a story the, the old Zuse friends don't stop to tell me Last remark I would have made slips out of my mind, so we continue the plot and the story. Mm. I think it's more didactical and more fun to talk at length about the three founding fathers of our Turing galaxy, our computer age, um, than to uh, go into actual, well-developed, well -developed, very complicated stuffs and personal names. So instead of talking of Paul Ottolini, Ottolini <coughs> and Pat Gelsinger, formerly, Gelsinger, formerly technical chief of Intel Corporation, nowadays thrown out because the Itanium has proven a, a failure, a brilliant architecture has not been accepted by the industry and people, populations. So Ottolini stays alone. This is not, a, I just mention it, and go back to the founding fathers. And like to comp compare their death, their kinds of death, their kinds of dying, as the German poet has, Ingeborg Bachmann pretends there is no death in general, pretended said there is no death in general, there are only personal ways to die or to death. and that is to be murdered by somebody or something. Um, mm -hmm. Tanya told me that probably you didn't quite catch my final point. I wanted to suggest that Turing was no Turing's death was no suicide but somehow triggered by the British uh, foreign spionage, spionage agencies and I wanted to suggest that the death of Michael Ventris was no crazy car accident but somehow equally related to Bletchley Park and betraying the mysteries of uh, the Colossi, Colossi and the uh, 
computer, computerized decipherment of, of messages. Now you probably you got the point and Tanya was strong in suggesting that you didn't get the point. <laughs> And now at a death which was really a suicide without knowing it was the death of Janosch, Johann, Johnny von Neumann. Neumann came out of a millionaire's Jewish Budapest family of bankers and the last Austrian emperor made his father to a noble, gave this title of nobility, Janosch von Neumann, and, and Janosch, Hungarian Janosch, no other European understood, so he changed his name um, to Johann, German, and taught at the University of Berlin under Hitler's regime just one summer and he emigrated only in, in late in, in 33 to Princeton where he engaged um, and enduring and became John von Neumann a, a womanizer married a great and elegant womanizer and car driver. <coughs> it's, it's very expensive car. In some accidents he survived. But the thing he didn't survive was this, his construction of the hydrogenic bomb. When it was tested on some bikini island or so, he came too close to a observation from a, to a, too close on his observation point and he was also contaminated as some poor Japanese fisherman and he got cancer in all his members and he died a cruel death in the military hospital of Washington DC and before his room there were two uh, Military policemen with, while he died, with guns, automatic guns, because it could have, it could ha have happened that Delirius von Neumann had could cr cry out to Soviet agents, having mm, forced their way into this hospital. The, the deepest strategic secrets of the Pentagon and the uh, U.S. Atomic uh, Department. And so he died by an involuntary suicide. You shouldn't come too near to your own bomb. <laughs> and the only one of the three Founding fathers who died of a of a of a, of a heavy death, let me say so. I know this from his widow. Uh, was Claude Albert Shannon. He simply got Alzheimer. The great player and gamer and and wonderful uh, husband. At the end of his long life, forget everything he had invented and constructed and his toys, his wonderful toys and the toys to, to laugh and toys to weep and at the end he died <clears throat> and happy forgetful death. And one of my young PhD doctors I sent to the widow and she was very very giving and helpful to us to publish Shannon's papers and showing some of his toys. But alas, as the French say, the, the most moving of Shannon's toys has disappeared 
yeah, the, the house and the cellar of one of his, one of his daughters uh, had been um, overcome by water, just as in the case of Katrina or Katrina of in, in New Orleans, and so the the toy was drowned and it doesn't exist anymore. But at Bell Labs they have a photo and and we, we, came, we came to this photograph. <laughs> and, now, and I, I put ahead, I put away all the job on the, on the, on the one side of Shannon's and all the juggling machines of Shannon. I just concentrate on this uh, more or less funny and at the same time more or less melancholy toy. When Shannon had become a, a millionaire by his own doings and not by heritage from his rich father as von Neumann had done, Shannon wrote the first software program to predict future shares and, and, and Holdings. And this algorithm worked quite, rather well, and Shannon got stocks and could aff afford himself and his family a beautiful house uh, at, a strand, at, at, this, at, at very near to Lake Mystery near Cambridge, Massachusetts. And there the to toys were were kept during his lifetime. Ah, I, before I come to the wonderful toy, uh, let me tell you a bit about Shannon's office. <coughs> there, there was a desk and then and on one side it was Shannon's seat and on the other side was a wall and on the wall was a big picture of David Hilbert and Shannon, the gamer and player, had taken some writing tool and changed this photo of Hilbert by adding a, a moustache in the, in the Hitler's sense. Looks very strange. Um, <laughs> and now to the toy. <coughs> it was a simple black box. I know in uh, the very concept of black box comes from the Second World War, where, where some secret device of the enemy could probably fall into the hands of the other side. And then, uh, when you opened it, when you, when, when you as a German opened an, a British uh, airplane device, fighter device, the device would explode before the Germans could, could inspect it. This is a black box. And so the black box shouldn't be opened but tested from only from input and output functions. Reverse engineering as AMD did with Intel uh, chips. The, the correlations between military and commercial uh, spionage are very close, as you see. And so a black box um, in, the, in this expensive house in Lake, at Lake Mystery, Mystery. and when, whenever one of Shannon's many friends entered this house, was invited as a friend, uh, he saw this black box and saw a switch and two inscriptions on the black box, white inscriptions on the black box, above the switch and electric switch and, the, and below the switch. And one inscription above was on and the other below was off. And the position, the actual position of the, of the black box whenever somebody entered uh, was off. And so the brands were tempted to change the state of the machine from off to on, 
and if it did so, the, the lid of the machine opened itself and a jack and the hand of the jack out of the box showed a, a mechanic hand. It, come, it came up, it turned in a horizontal direction and then into a vertical direction deeper, below and below until the mechanical hand reached the switch, took it between mm -hmm. its fingers and put the switch again from on to off. <laughs> when the hand, the hand retired slowly and the lid closed over, over the hand and the apparatus uh, was quiet and the algorithm had, had finished, completed in a, in a finite time. But now what, what would you think? Is it, is it amusing or melancholy? Both. Because? Because? Because it's, um, it is um, amusing because of the hand, which um, the symbol of the black box represents um, an explosion. And um, so that's the comic, is the hand coming and um, switching it back off. And slightly melancholy because of the stereotype of what the black box um, intends to do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I can give you another but equivalent explanation. Um, I knew of the box for already two or three decades and only lately we got the photo. And so I had to correct my own in, uh, funny interpretation into a more or less melancholic or tragic way, one, because the photo shows that the, co that the black, box, black box was scaped just like a black coffin. <laughs> And when I read of an artificial dough uh, constructed by, a, by the first Greek, old Greek engineer, this mechanical or machinic, machinic dough was able to start a flight and to fly a little bit and to land up at the end of the, of the flight, but it could not start again a second time. And then it, and then uh, I brought back at, Ch at, Chan at Shannon's black box and it came to me that both machines are the same machine. We are born just for once and we have to die just for once. This would, would be the meaning of the black coffin. There is no Christian eternity. <coughs> but now let's become serious again and connect the China to the aftermath of the war. <coughs> Shannon had just as Turing worked for the for crypto analysis in Pentagon projects given out to Bell Labs, AT&T, American Telegraph and Telephone, the leading electric company of its time after its uh, dissociation by some after war president or House of Representatives. Um, but he obviously, as during, he wasn't allowed to publish his crypto analytical fa findings only after their de declassification by the secret services, uh, the information theory of cryptographic systems, 
could be published in the early 50s. And from this rather secret paper, uh, Shannon, did very interesting paper, made a second step further and wrote his, mm, how, was, how was the title in Bell Lab Journal in 48. A mathematical theory of communication systems, I think. And um, this was, this needed no declassification because it never spoke on war and cryptoanalysis and secrecy systems. It just, it just uh, formulated <coughs> the most prominent or dominant uh, mathematical model of, in, of information in, 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 in the general case. Unfortunately, the afterword by some uh, popularizing writer <coughs> has misled many readers so that they overlooked the, the depths and the elegance of the mathematical part written by Shannon himself. <coughs> I have to concentrate. Uh, after Shannon had been divorced from his first wife during World War II, and after that married again Betty Elizabeth, uh, Shannon <coughs> became interested in poetry and literature because she was a teacher and is a teacher in the case she still lived. Uh, and that's, that's why, strangely enough, in a very mathematical paper, James Joyce is mentioned and, and crossword riddles are mentioned and Philological questions are looked in the, the eye. And in private, in privacy, Shannon wrote poetry, very elegant and very complicated and very formal in the sense of strict, strictest English, um, in, in the sense of John Donne and, and in the way of John Donne, rhyming in absolutely new rhymes, never heard before him or read before him, fantastic things. And some poems are poems on, on marvelous uh, children's toys, like Rubik's Cubic and so. But, and so I think, Shannon became to uh, was in was inspired by his wife uh, to begin this mathematical theory of information and communication systems. Uh, this is most with the simplest in, with the simplest case the case of letters. We have a system. On the input side, we have a system that takes as its input human writing or human speech transformed into writing, and as its output, it produces just alphabetic letters. It, it gives, it transmits these letters uh, on a thick, on a channel with, with, without noise or with noise, a channel. A, noise, a noisy channel or noiseless channel to a receiver which then receives this let, these letters and transforms them then into some human, humanly readable form because uh, the, the, these letters may be letters that have undergone a cryptographical transformation, as in the case of the German Enigma 
so the receiver and should re should should decode the crypto analytical part and give and give out as output just the plain text minus the crypto analytical noise the intended noise in opposition to the uh, natural noise in, in use by the physical channel, it, channel itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So this is Shannon's famous model. Sender, the emitter, the channel, how should I call this, this would be the receiver in relation to the empfanger and this would be, let's say the encoder and that then this would be the decoder. Names doesn't, uh, don't count much in this field. <laughs> <coughs> and only in, is in his secret writing on secrecy systems, Shannon mentions the case where some enemy mm, succeeds in getting a connection to the channel and then builds up an unfriendly decoder and an unfriendly receiver. But clearly, yes, this ad additional possibility always in mind. But now the question, why letters as a start-up, not analog, sig analog signals, voice signals, and so on, electric radio signals, wireless signals, as all information theorists had done, had begun before him. The answer, Shannon's interest, Shannon's digital think thinking, as criticized by Norbert Wiener, as I told you this morning, and his interest in researching. And then it becomes more and more mathematical, and only one among my actual listeners <laughs> will understand. Shannon, uh, cause makes his way from random letters to Markov chains or the first order, the second order, and so on. And Markov chains, these are chains between letters, and their transition uh, um, statistical uh, properties. And with a six or seventh order Markov chain, uh, Shannon arrives at almost English texts. He, so he approximates English speech or English text better, more properly, uh, by mathematical tools invented in St. Petersburg. 1913 by Alexei Alexeyevich uh, Markov, the, the elder. Markov chains uh, in a, are tools for approximating poems and literature since Markov's days, Eugene, uh, Yevgeny, Onyegin of the Poem of by Pushkin, 
uh, was the object of Markov and English words, English sentences were Shannon's goal. And Markov chains in Shannon's mind are closely related to the solving of crossword puzzles because you have to uh, intu intuitively um, feel the Markov change which make up English let letters in their consequence one after the other. I give you an example from the gold bug by Edgar Allan Poe, great cryptographer, crypto analyst, and when in the gold bug the story is about deciphering a very simple cryptogram written by a famous pirate to hide his treasure on a tropical island. And the hero of the, of the short story uh, can uh, crack, crack the code and he starts from the fact that the most frequent English letter is E and the most frequent uh, letter transition in English therefore is HE because the digram, di digram, digram HE is part of the trigram TH. And having got to that, the, the hero in post story comes, gets H and T, and having the three of the most frequent letters of English, uh, he can proceed to other words and so on and so on. Mm. And this is a brilliant example of a of a very frequent uh, Markov chain linking H and E. And, and the stop sign, the, uh, the, 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 the non-sign between two, letter, two, two, two words. Yeah? Mm -hmm. um, I think I did it and you got the point of Markov change and Shannon's interest in them, okay? Then Let's make one step further. Some letter diagrams, not diagrams, but diagrams, two letter sequences uh, as diodes, you see, you remember from yesterday. Uh, would be, I forgot the beginning of my phrase, uh, there are in, in English and German too, there are and in many European languages, French and so, and Spanish and what else, what have you, there is a, there is a certain sequence of two letters which reads, You, you, and as you know, by road, you are allowed as English writers to write the U without the Q, Q, but not the other way around. After every Q follows a new U, and that's why Shannon called this second U in this position as the, the second letter in this Besides a diagram, a redundancy. A redundancy, a non necessity which doesn't produce any sense over the sense of the queue, behind, beyond the sense of the queue itself. And so, in, he got to his famous theorem that code could be optimized over 
in relation to everyday, everyday script. In, in, in order to spare transmission time, you just can skip, skip, in this case, the U, and the receiving end gets the message nevertheless. And, and then Shannon measured the inherent redundancy of different Indo-European languages, measured them by percent, and measured these percentages as a fine means of cryptoanalysis uh, in a given language. And declared at the same time uh, that this very redundancy is helpful in everyday life. We have to be redundant in order to understand each, each other. But every life is the contrary, the opposite side of, of military and engineering life. <laughs> we had it over lunch. And so, um, uh, for military or scientific purposes, uh, all redundancy had, has better to be, be thrown out. And then there arises a theoretical question or problem, what is the optimal code? And in the case of a fictional, fictional language, uh, writing system, which had, has only two signs, namely zero and one, uh, I, probably I can make, make uh, feelable to you Shannon's uh, counter-concept of redundancy and this counter-concept, this opposite concept is neg entropy, the minimum of Boltzmann's entropy. What is the info most information, what is the optimum of information content in a in a, under noiseless optimal conditions in a perfect uh, language of only two letters. I won't go into the, into the details of Shannon's a probabilistic function of negentropy and redundancy. But one of the bri most brilliant results of his theory is the following graph. Zero, one. One point five, better one half, and and one the optimum, because in a random sequences of zeros and ones. Um, uh, the optimal distribution between these two letters in a probabilistic sense is the, that both occur equally often. That is, the ones and the zeros have, a, have inside the message a part of 50%. And in the case, uh, the zeros are dominant, the information content goes down and down and finally to zero, as in the case of Q and U. And if the ones 
it dominates the zeros, the same takes place and no information is transmitted anymore. If you a letter sequence that contains only zeros or only ones is meaningless and not informative in the sense I gave you this very, mo this very morning when I spoke about Leibniz's discovery, philosophical discovery, that there can, can't be any uh, number system on the basis of just one sign. We need two signs, as in Shannon's case. And re regrettably, neither Shannon, Claude Shannon, nor Betty Shannon had read Leibniz and <laughs> discovered uh, the, uh, his, his, his philosophical uh, ancestor. But I am here and in Berlin to make this link. It's my mission to make this link, not because I'm just here and born in Berlin, but it's my, it's not my profession. It's not, my, it's not just my profession, it's my, it's my philosophical duty, let's say. Okay. Mm. One very puzzling or surprising result of this uh, optimal code problem was and is the fact that oh, that the, this optimum case can also be attained by the strictest random noise and the, uh, let's say, the most brilliant random noise, senseless, nonsense random noise you, get, you transmit over this channel. Um, so between noise in its optimal form and code in its optimal form, there's no difference at all. And, and so it's difficult to to take uh, to build up a semantics of communication out of Shannon's theory. Shannon himself throws away semantics on the first page of his paper, saying that uh, a message which, which stays, uh, which remains identical to itself under all given conditions of time and space, uh, is. Is not worth to be transmitted at all. So, for instance, Shannon's example is the number p pi, and my example would be the Decalogue. It stays identical to itself forever by transmitted. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. This was after this heresy. <laughs> Let's come back to. Facts. Could you repeat what you last said? Um, Shannon's was the pie and yours. Um... On the Decalogue. Okay, thank you. I won't repeat this statement. Sorry. <laughs> thank you. Please. What about the case when you have alternating zeros and ones huh? all the way mm -hmm. through the message? Well ordered. Right. Yeah. With a Shannon doesn't uh, discuss this case, and my answer is uh, would come this evening and not, not yet. I have to think it over. Let's make an end to this information theory, which is very, whose first pages and last pages are very understandable for readers, only in the middle, in the mathematical part of it, 
it becomes more and more difficult and I I can read about eight or ten more pages and then I skip some pages, some twenty pages and then I find refine myself in the text. But it's nevertheless we translated it into German, this can be done. Mathematics remain the same, whether one understands them or can repeat them or, or not. Um, so let's simply state that Shannon on his last pages um, makes a very strange and new and innovative swift, swift from, from digital to analog communication, communication in the elder sense, older sense. He simply poses radio, wireless signals and television signals and these kinds of continuous uh, functions uh, as discrete digital with infinitesimal uh, powers of two. So simple. And so straightforward is mine. You see, the, old, the good old Bell Labs, one of the great winners of World War II, long gone. Um, where a wonderful place, where software and hardware in the aftermath of the war saw new horizons and possibility. And almost at the same, in the same year when, when Shannon was allowed to publish his secret paper on information systems, I mean this, I just referred to you, I noted a paper on secrecy system. Um, the Bell Labs um, were proud to pr present a new hardware device, the transistor. Hope, hopefully you are shocked that this everyday uh, object you know probably but have, have never seen in difference to me or never handled um, has, has, has had its history. Three young physicists, Chuckley, Bardeen and Breton, I think. But I, 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 my, my, my brain is just capable of storing forever Chuckley and Bardeen. Mm. And all three later got the Nobel Prize for, the, for their invention, and rightly so, let me say. Um, but shocking to say uh, is that Gray Chocley was called to Stanford University, being a worldwide celebrity, and in his old age became America's leading racist. All, every Negro man he demanded in, in public should be uh, emasculated, castrated, in order to put an end to this Silly race or race of the yeah, race of of Nico put at all, but nobody could really contradict him because his fame, because of his fame.
transistor in its most usual form. This is my German writing for 12 volt or 5 volt, some very classical and orthodox voltages in low frequency, in low voltage systems, that is in digital systems, in computer systems and so on. Uh, and around the mass, hopefully uh, with zero voltage in relation to its environment. In practice, this can't be reached and every every high fee fan was ever heard the humming of his equipment knows about the earthing problem of electrical systems. So this is a positive electricity running into the transistor and going down to Mars. And a second low, I forgot to resist on, a very low voltage and low uh, ampere, low current system, let's say of 2 volt is connected to this vertical stroke and you are re reminded of what you want <coughs> natural you are reminded of course you should be reminded of the diode of the triode and if you don't be reminded you are stupid pupils and I'm a <coughs> teacher what you you ever the drawing is not very fine and I, I'm, I'm, I'm not a good painter, so it's, it's just the equivalent uh, circuitry of, of the same hardware principles as a tube, the old foot of two, tube, but the tube replaced by the transistor because because transistors are smaller than tubes, about one or one and a half decades. That is to say, the transistor at my time was in reality some micrometers big, but uh, but its its covering, its shield. Uh, it's very. It needed. It needs a shield, and this shield had a height of about three millimeters, and a, and it was and a vertical. Vertically, it it was just or horizontally. Sorry, it was just one and a half millimeter or so. And, and a tube is, was in, in, the, in the walls of, in the time of the years of the Second World War with two centimeters in width and um, let's say four or five centimeters in, in height. Mm -hmm. And that's, that is the best reason why transistors have superseded uh, Electronic electrical tubes. So um, another big step in into miniaturization has been taken by Shockley and his collaborators. And the step was not only important for the given reasons, but for the fact that the, the transistor came back to 
Ferdinand Braun's great discovery that in nature there exist semiconductors. But whereas Braun had experimented with natural semiconductors, the semiconductor produced by the team of Shockley on the Shockley's direction uh, produced uh, an artificial, the first artificial semiconductor to my knowledge. In their uh, time, in the, in the old, young, in the early days, uh, the, the elements of a transistor were germ the element germanium and its oxide, and in later days up to now, in my days, uh, the elements were silicon and its oxide, Se and S. E O two. As E combined with <coughs> and the big advantage of silicon and its oxide over germanium is that germanium is very rare seldom on earth, and silicon is, a, I think, the third in the array of the most frequent and ubiquitous elements, because every pebble on every strand can be turned into the purest silicon, and this is the hardware basis of, of all commuting devices and I think Baka Industries in, in Bavaria is leading, worldwide leading in production of the purest silicon you can imagine. No other elements disturb the 99.9999 purity of this element mm -hmm. in big piles. Mm -hmm. And when the piles are sliced very in, in, into micrometer uh, slices and then on one die, one slice, uh, are pro produced by electrolytic or yeah, procedures <laughs> some 22 or 64 identical chips and then the, the die, the slice is broken into uh, 20, 32 or 64 uh, microchips mm -hmm. and you have them and you sell them. I I forgot to mention two things which concern not